So now that we have a basic understanding of how plant hormones work and their general characteristics, we're going to be now looking at the first class of hormones uh, called auxins. And we'll entitle this next flowchart auxins 1. And to begin, when we look at this class of hormones, what we're going to first establish is the fact that auxins themselves were the first plant hormone to be officially discovered. So we'll write that down. First plant hormone to be discovered. And interestingly enough, hopefully you think this is interesting, uh, this was actually first discovered by Mr. Charles Darwin, a very good friend of ours uh, as general biology students, and also his son. So Darwin and his son were the first to find out about these auxin class hormones, and they were done through a, a series of experiments. So let's look at those experiments. So this is what happened. Darwin and his son uh, basically looked at the idea of phototropism, growing towards light. So this was basically a, an experiment based off of the idea of phototropism, moving towards light. And if you take a look at this figure, it's called a colliptial figure. And this is going to be exemplified on figure 38.9b. This is basically what Darwin studied. Darwin and his son. And if you understand the basic idea and growth of this, you can really understand how auxins work because a colliptile is the first part of grass. So we'll write this down as first part of grass. Uh, and that's going to emerge from the soil. To emerge from soil. So we're talking about some sort of growth pattern right now. Emerging from soil sounds a lot like growth and that's what plant hormones are really importantly in charge of. In addition, what's going to happen is that this colliptile was exposed to light. But specifically, so we'll write exposed to light, but it was only from one direction. So from only one direction. Not the band, but this idea of light coming only from one way. And because of that, what's going to happen is exemplified in figure 39.5. Essentially, when you have light only coming from one specific direction, and you have this colliptile that's growing out to, uh, from this grass seedling, you're going to have growth specifically at the tip. That's the basic conclusion. That growth of the plant started at the tip, and then because of this, the tip is actually going to bend towards the light. Bends toward light. Why is that? Well, that's because this is, a, this is all going to be governed by a plant hormone that focuses on phototropism, growing towards light. And that's the basic idea behind Darwin's experiment. He saw this little grass seedling structure, and he wanted to know, if I cover it on the top, is it going to grow? If I cover it in the middle, is it going to grow? Or if I cover it on the bottom, is it going to grow? If you look at this figure, 39.5, you will see that in his experiment, he noticed that it is at the tip where the growth begins and also is maintained, and thus that's basically where we're seeing these oxen hormones really sort of establish themselves. So speaking of these auxin hormones, now that we have a little bit of history down, let's talk about some general characteristics of these hormones. So general characteristics of auxins, a class of hormones. First of all, auxins can either be natural or artificial. They can be synthesized and thus it would be good to help other plants grow, right? It'd be good in uh, you know certain farming industries. So they're natural and artificial. Their main mechanism relies on the work of this following molecule, IAA, which stands for indole acetic acid. Indole acetic acid. So what is the purpose of indole acetic acid? This is actually going to be the most common and the most important, so we'll write this down, most common slash important plant auxin. So it's very important in terms of plant growth, therefore. Plant auxin. Okay, so what? What does it do? What makes it so common and so important? Well, first of all, based off of these experiments, it makes sense that this IAA, indole acetic acid, is actually mainly going to be produced, it's mainly synthesized and produced at the shoot apical meristem shoot apical meristem. Remember, there's a root apical meristem also. But here, we're saying it's at the shoot apical meristem. Why? Well, because Darwin established that this hormone, based off of this colliptile experiment, functions at the tip of the plant. 
at the tip of this grass seedling, let's say. Thus, that's the tip of the shoot. And that's where the apical meristem, remember, that's a point of lots and lots of cell division, lots and lots of growth. How is that growth governed? How is it guided? It's guided by IAA, an indole acetic acid, which is an auxin, which is a plant hormone that allows for successful plant growth. How does it do this? Well, indole Ox, indole acetic acid, uh, it moves unidirectionally. That's something to note. Okay, it moves in one direction only, unidirectionally, and this is going to be down the chute. So it starts at the top, and this chemical messenger, remember, this is a hormone, it has to move around and send a message somewhere. If it wants to go somewhere, it can only move unidirectionally downwards through down the chute via the root axis. That's what it would use. And this would be through an active transport mechanism. Okay, because it's a it's a molecule that needs to be moved around via ATP. So that's our basic idea behind the auxins. It's basically the major auxin to remember is IAA, indole acetic acid, made at the chutes and moving unidirectionally. In addition, Based off of this sort of establishment of IAA and what it does, we can basically summarize the main function of auxins altogether. Because remember, this is just one example of an auction, but basically when you think of auxins as a whole, their main function is simply in growth. And the best way to say that would be cell elongation. And the best way to understand cell elongation, the true mechanism behind it, is to first, of course, establish that this is going to be at the shoots. Hopefully this is clear by now. Darwin said it was at the tip, thus it was at the shoots, and we know that IAA functions and is produced mainly at the shoot, thus its cell elongation is going to happen at the shoots. Now, what is going to allow for cell elongation? Well, that's going to be the cell wall. The cell wall is a structure that specifically elongates and allows for the cell to grow. And if the cell is elongating, that would mean the shoot is elongating, that would mean the tip of the plant is elongating, that would mean the plant as a whole is growing successfully. Now, the specifics that you need to understand about the cell wall is that, of course, there's a primary cell wall, so primary CW, and also a secondary cell wall. But remember, there's a difference in structure between these that's critical in understanding where the cell wall elongation is happening. If you look at the primary cell wall, the primary cell wall may, mainly consists of cellulose, fibers. Okay? But these cellulose fibers can be, let's say, changed because they're a little bit maneuverable. And we'll see how in just a second. But just notice right now that the cellulose fibers can be changed. They can be manipulated and sort of they're malleable. They're changeable. Whereas the secondary cell wall consists of cellulose. But remember, what else does it consist of? If it's there, it also consists of lignin, which is that very, very strong structural polymer. And thus, this is going to actually be unable to expand. So what's the key point here? What's the purpose of saying this, this differentiation? That would mean that auxins thus not only function at the shoots, but function at the cell wall, but specifically what cell wall? The primary cell wall is of focus when we're talking about any auxin because that's what can be changed, manipulated, and elongated. The secondary cell wall cannot for the following structural polysaccharide, uh, structural polymer, I should say, being present there. So. Basically, last thing we want to do now is establish a mechanism. How does auxin do its job? And again, when we're talking about hormones, we have to understand that there's going to be a stepwise progression of different steps that's going to allow for an end physiological response, as we saw in our first flowchart. So the mechanism follows the following uh, hypothesis. It's called the acid growth hypothesis. Now, you'll understand why it's called the acid growth hypothesis in just a second. So, what I'm going to do is a stepwise sort of directional uh, showing of how auxin would work. So, this is what first we're going to do. In so for this mechanism to work, you have to have uh, auxin be present, right? So, what we're going to say is that auxin activity, essentially, if auxin is being produced, wherever it's being produced, whenever auxin is being produced, it actually increases, I'm going to write in big arrow sign here, it increases the activity of hydrogen pumps. Okay, so when you increase the activity of hydrogen pumps, this automatically increases the acidity because you're adding more and more protons in some sort of region. Okay, so what's going to happen is that you're going to create a low pH. Creates a low pH. When you have a low pH, 
you are officially in an uh, acidic sort of environment. That's why it's called the acid growth hypothesis. But we still haven't talked about how the growth actually happens. We've only established that there's lots of protons in some area where auxin's being produced because it's increasing the H pumps. Those pumps are going to be pumping more and more protons, creating a low pH in the environment. What is this going to do next? Once you have a low pH, you actually activate a very important protein. This activates, a low pH that is, activates uh, a protein called expansins. Okay? Expansins. Once expansins have been activated, look at the name of these proteins, expansins. They're going to expand something, or at least be a part of an expansion process. They're going to create, they're going to do their job. They're activated by this low pH. Once that low pH is there and expansins are ready to function, they're going to do the following. Their job is to separate cellulose, and remember, this is at the primary cell wall, don't forget that. Cellulose, they're called microfibrils, they're just smaller sections of cellulose. Separate cellulose microfibrils from these other sections of cellulose called cross-linking polysaccharides. So that's a very fancy way of simply saying uh, what the expanses will do is, if there's a low pH, they'll come in and they'll make the cell wall basically more exposed and loosened. So we're going to write this down. More exposed slash loosened cell wall. CW for cell wall. Why? Well, you're, you're basically eliminating a, a strong interaction between these microfibrils from the cross-linking polysaccharides, how the expansins come in and they separate them. They separate these two sort of structural components, making the cell wall overall more exposed and loosened. Okay, what does this do? This then activates the following. This is, allows an enzyme to come in. We don't need to know the name of the enzyme. We'll just say enzyme can come in and do the following. The enzyme can cleave, it could separate the cross-linking polysaccharides. Now, the cross-linking polysaccharides are what are really going to be the things that are allowing for the cellulose and the cell wall, the primary cell wall, to simply be very strong and structural. But remember, it can be changed. Why can it be changed? Well, that's because the enzymes cleave, they break off these cross-linking polysaccharides. When you do that, this allows the cellulose microfibrils to slide. So cellulose microfibrils, they're basically going to move around a little bit. They'll slide. They'll slide here and there. But what does this eventually do? All of this, okay, this stepwise action of this hormone causes the following end ultimate result. This will allow the following. Water naturally enters via osmosis into every single plant cell, okay? So water enters via osmosis. Big deal. This usually happens. That's normal. But what's abnormal or what's different is that there's going to be a great amount of turgor pressure being sort of added to this area of the cell wall that's already loosened and sort of primed for growth. And when you have this turgor pressure and water forcing itself into a sort of loosened area, this is going to allow the cell to expand. And when the cell expands, it's going to expand the cell on the left and the right. And all the cells in this apical meristem, the shoot structure at the shoots are going to all expand. Thus, you will have a growth. You will have the auxins, which started it all, auxin. Auxin is what increases activity of H pumps, causing an acid sort of environment, and thus you have growth. That's why it's called the acid growth hypothesis. Lots of steps involved here. Basically, think of it like this. You have H pumps, you have acidity, expansins, like acidity, expansins are going to loosen the cell wall. That's going to allow different enzymes to come in and loosen it even more. That's going to allow for a movable cell wall. That's going to allow for water to come in and expand the cell as a whole. And that covers our first look at auxins. We'll look at some applications of auxins in the next video.